Anime Recap Tier. Today I'm going to explain a game action anime called Batum. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. In a barren ghost town, abandoned buildings and vehicles all over the area have been destroyed, looking like the aftermath of an ongoing battle. A man is breathing heavily while scanning the area from behind a wall in one of the old buildings. He seems to be taking cover from something. Soon, his attention shifts to a device on his wrist and a single dot then shows up on the monitor. Suddenly, a red armored man appears right in front of him and throws a bomb in his way, causing a huge explosion. Barely dodging, he makes a run for it. As he turns to a corner, another bomb is thrown in the air, but this time, it spreads a hazardous mist that blocks his only way out. Seconds later, his assailant breaks through a glass window, then tackles him to the ground. The impact leaves him unconscious. A bomb is then thrown directly at him, killing him and leaving the attacker to regroup with his friends and celebrate their win. But as bombastic as the sequence is, it all comes from a video game. Sealing the team's victory is Ryota Sakamoto, a jobless 22-year-old. Ryota spends most of his time playing video games and hardly ever leaves his room. He still lives with his parents and only interacts with his friends online. Batum has recently become the most popular game in all of Japan and is famous for being an action-type game that uses bombs called beams as weapons instead of guns. Ryota is the only player in Japan who's had a team that made it to the top 10 global ranks. Batum has a lot more to offer than just pure, unadulterated carnage though. It has other events like visiting arenas or even getting unofficially married to other players. You want it? They got it, baby! And Ryota himself has an in-game wife. More than that, Batum is the place where he stands atop everyone. He may be a bum in real life, but Ryota is superior there. He's content. After their victory, Ryota's friends invite him to play another round. But before he can reply, his mother suddenly barges into the room. She confronts Ryota for being in neat and complains about how he does nothing but play games in his room all day. He tries to remain calm at first, promising that he's going to get a job soon. But she retorts that he's been saying that for years now. And yet, Ryota is still jobless, still a leecher, and still not looking. Since she's convinced that he won't be able to get a job on his own, she tells him that she found a job for him as a part-timer at the local convenience store. Finally, Ryota loses it. He throws his controller at her and yells at her for meddling with his life. He insists that he'll do what he wants before demanding her to get out of his room, leaving his mother in a terrified shock. But after some time, Ryota actually applied to work for Batum developers. Clad in a formal attire, he meets one of the company representatives, who tells him that it might take a while before he could start. When Ryota heads home, he snaps at his mother for submitting his application to the store before asserting that he's never working there and storming out. His mother stares blankly ahead, a dreadful, world-weary look etched on her face. As Ryota is leaving a convenience store, two suited men approach him, and that's the last thing he saw before everything turned black. Ryota wakes up and finds himself in the middle of a jungle like nowhere. He sees that a parachute is attached to his back and discovers that he doesn't have any memory of how he had gotten there. Roaming around the area for a while, he finds a bag filled with food, clothes, and other supplies. Rummaging through more of its contents, he finds his ID inside it. He realizes the bag belongs to him, further confirming that he did intend to travel and go somewhere but still can't figure out why. Along with his personal items, he finds a smaller bag containing 10 identical and weirdly shaped boxes. He doesn't think much about the mysterious package and just brings it with him. At the same time, he continues to look for a way out, bumping into various insects and creatures that easily startle him along the way. Soon after, Ryota finds a forest clearing that leads to an open beach around sundown. Just when he's about to relax, he sees a stranger running towards him from the other side of the beach. Thinking it's someone who could help him out, he waits for him to get closer to ask about where they are. His plan completely backfires when he realizes that his hope for returning home is lost. The man is said to unalive him with explosive and chases him like a maniac all over the beach. Not knowing what else he can do in the situation, he looks through the mysterious package from earlier. Ryota figures out that the weirdly designed boxes are actually bims similar to those given to the players in Batum. The chase goes on for a while, and Ryota attempts to reason with his assassin, asking why he's trying so hard to unalive them, given that they had never met before and the whole situation of being stranded on an island and being attacked by a complete stranger out of nowhere doesn't just happen every day. The guy only laughs at him, calling Ryota clueless. Evidently going bonkers, the stranger also tells him that killing is the only way to live where they are right now. Must have survived on only seawater the whole day. Seeing that he is serious about ending his life, Ryota camouflages himself on a patch of grass near a cliff by the beach and realizes he can activate his bims by setting off a 10-second timer. 
making a poor guess in finding where he is. The killer jumps over the cliff after accidentally setting off a timer-type beam that Ryota had planted for him. Finally, getting the gist of the situation and the kind of bombs he was given, Ryota takes the beams off the deceased guy and plans his next move. It's the next day and Ryota is still stuck on the island. He recalls yesterday's events. More of his memories have started to come back to him as well. The last thing he can remember is his mother staring at him while she apologizes for something he can't seem to recall. It had to be the important part that he forgets. His thoughts are interrupted when he hears someone nearby. When he checks it out, Ryota is stunned to see a girl taking a bath in front of him. He tries his best not to alert her, thinking she could possibly still be an enemy. The girl doesn't notice him for a while but becomes defensive once Ryota decides to approach her, and the two make eye contact. Ryota tries to calm her down at first, hoping that he could at least get some answers from her. The girl only looks at him with disgust, hurriedly gets dressed, then runs off deep into the forest, where he loses track of her. Guess that proves that being a peeping Tom doesn't get you the ladies. The girl that Ryota ran into is a high school student named Himiko, who is often mistaken as a foreigner because of her appearance. Himiko had moved alone to Japan and often plays Batum whenever she's at home. What's more, it is revealed that she is actually Ryota's bride in Batum. He had married her and had an actual wedding reception in-game. This is after becoming close and playing battles together with him. However, despite their closeness, they aren't aware of each other's real-life identities since Himiko doesn't want him to know who she really is. Before running into each other, Himiko had actually woken up on the island at the same time as Ryota and had teamed up with three other men who she first encountered in the beach. One of them is a teacher named Isamu Kondo, who first invited Himiko to join their group. The other is Masashi Miyamoto, an ex-member of the Japanese Special Defense Force. And the third is Mitsuo Akechi, an average guy who also played Batum. While staying with these three men, a flashback of Himiko's life in school before she ended up trapped in the island is shown. Himiko was friends with three other girls, Miho, Arisa, and Yuki. They were all close to each other in school, but her best friend Miho was the only one who shared her love of cosplay. In Himiko's memories, they took photos together while wearing outfits of their Batum characters. Miho was often seen following Himiko around. Himiko was having lunch with her friends when one of them brought out a flyer. The flyer was supposedly said to make the people they hate disappear just by putting that person's name on the paper. The four girls then laughed while joking about who they wanted to send off, believing that the whole idea of it was completely ridiculous. A couple of days after that, Himiko invited her friends to visit Yoshioka's house, a guy she became close to in her apartment complex. She told her friends to go on without her since she wanted to put her things back in her house first. When she went to Yoshioka's apartment, she felt that something was off when she entered. Himiko Himiko turns frozen on the spot when she sees two of her friends' bodies lying unconscious and undressed on the living room floor. Yoshiyoka and his friends then told her that they had originally planned to do it to Himiko alone. Himiko then tried to escape and was able to leave the apartment after kicking Yoshiyoka hard. Unfortunately, she couldn't save her friends, including Miho, who was trapped in a closet, desperately asking for her help by the entrance. The incident left all the girls traumatized. Arisa and Yuki both left Japan. On the other hand, Miho feels intense hatred towards her best friend for putting them in that situation. Back to the present, we see Himiko guarding all the bims of their team after they had elected her to be their leader since she's a girl. An argument then breaks out between Isamu and Masashi about the morality of their situation. Masashi argues that they have to use their bims to kill people and get off the island in order to protect themselves. Isamu argues back, saying that his responsibilities as a teacher and a sane adult won't allow him to take innocent lives. Without even hesitating, Masashi stabs Isamu on the back of his neck in front of Himiko and Akechi. Seeing that he's obviously a sadist and can go after them next, Akechi convinces Himiko that they should escape and team up as partners to leave the island. Himiko believes that he's a good person and, given the dangerous circumstances, agrees to go with him. He then grabs her hand and all their beams, and the two sneak away. However, Masashi notices them escaping and chases after them intending to kill the two. Luckily, Himiko and Akechi shake him off after using a blazing gas-type beam, similar to the one used in Ryota's match at the start of the story. The strategy works as Masashi runs away from them in the opposite direction. Himiko is thankful to Akechi, but soon becomes uncomfortable when he doesn't let go of her hand and tells her that they should be prepared to ambush people they meet on the way and kill them. Himiko doesn't agree with Akechi's plan and asks him to let go of her, not wanting to stay with him any longer. This upsets Akechi, and he immediately changes his personality and tries to force Himiko to do it with him, then and there, so that she won't leave him, all while comparing Himiko to his ex-girlfriend, who he forcibly did it with when things didn't go his way. Without any other choice, Himiko uses one of her beams to force him off of her and gets him to run away in a panic with his pants still down. Unfortunately for Akechi, the timer-type beam Himiko used landed on him on the last second. After digesting the fact that she had just murdered someone, Himiko cries and stays down on the spot.
spot, still trembling from what had almost happened. Back to Ryota, who is still searching for Himiko in the woods, he ends up meeting another person cowering in fear behind a bush, Kiyoshi Taira. Unlike the man who tried to kill Ryota in the beginning, Taira begs Ryota to spare his life and offers to form an alliance with him to leave the island. Ryota initially doesn't want to team up with anyone, but decides the chances for survival are better if someone has his back. Before agreeing to team up, he first tests Taira to see if he could at least be trusted and not slow him down, since it's practically a middle-aged man in a real-life action game. He asks Taira to show him the type of beams he has and how many are left, and he'll do the same afterwards. Even though he's desperate for protection, Taira doesn't show Ryota any of his beams, reasoning that he'll be at a disadvantage and he doesn't completely trust Ryota yet. Realizing that he's not just an average adult and is actually pretty clever, Ryota agrees to team up with him for his honest response. While traveling together, Taira informs Ryota of how all these people had ended up on the island to play a real-life game of Batum. A mysterious and eccentric man had brought all the players there using a plane. The man had them that they had all been sent there for the purpose of testing an experiment by the company that Ryota had just been hired to work for. For any of them to leave the island, a player must collect at least six chips apart from the ones that are embedded in their own hands. The catch is, to collect the chips, they must get them from the bodies of dead players. In short, they have to duke it out, battle royal style. Ryota and Taira meet several other players as they survive the game. One of them is a mentally disturbed kid who murdered people in Japan, Kosuke, with who Ryota had a one-on-one -on -one battle and spared his life afterwards. He doesn't want to hurt people, and Ryota only took his beams and food supply to survive and left him tied up on a tree. When night falls, the duo spends the time replenishing their energy and talking about their lives back in the city. Taira willingly shares about his job as a strict manager to his co-workers and how poorly he treated them in contrast to being a caring and supportive family man to his wife and daughter at home. After getting to know more about Taira and hearing about his private life, Ryota starts to trust him a little more and believes that partnering up with him wasn't a bad decision. The next day, Ryota and Himiko meet again when he spots her throwing Akechi's blazing gas type beams on top of a mountain. Not wanting her to be alone in a dangerous island, Ryota does everything he can to reason with her and persuade her to join his team. Haunted by the memory of Yoshioka and Akechi, she doesn't listen to him. Instead, she threatens to take her own life, thinking that she might as well die instead of becoming a victim of another guy. But before the timer could hit zero, Ryota knocks her out with a taser gun that she's been carrying the whole time and uses her hand to deactivate the bomb. He then proceeds to carry her back down to where he and Taito were resting. As soon as she wakes up, they promise her that they wouldn't do anything to harm her. Even that Ryota hadn't done anything to her while being unconscious, Himiko at least keeps her guard up but doesn't try to run away from them. In the middle of eating ramen together, Himiko shares information about how they all ended up on the island. Someone who knows them had purposely chosen them to be sent to the island. Taira instinctively thinks that it's one of his customers, while Ryota remembers his mom. Unexpectedly, a whole pack of alligators come out from the woods and chase them throughout the forest, with Ryota carrying Himiko not being able to move due to the after effects of the taser. Taira is carrying all their beams since he had been bitten by one of the alligators while running. When they've managed to outrun the alligators, Ryota realizes that he and Taira have been split up. He then panics when he can't detect them on his radar and realizes that all their beams and food supply are with him. Just then, he remembers the conversation of Taira being worried that Ryota will eventually give up on him in a dangerous situation, and he would understand if something like that happens. Ryota starts to regret that he ever trusted him, but then he hears Taira calling his name. The three successfully reunite. Ryota then realizes that they were both looking for each other through their radars, which causes them to cancel out. As a result, they weren't able to detect one another. Ryota immediately apologizes to Taira for ever doubting him. After the touching moment, the three regroup in a secluded building and stay together for the time being. It's a harsh and unpredictable world, but not one they have to walk alone as long as they have anything to say about it. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.